my name is uh, Michael R. Mirabella, and I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and raised in East Harlem, Manhattan, then from there on to South Bronx, and from there uh, to, to the military. Joined the Army at, uh, on my 17th birthday in 1947. Took my basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey, one of the first courses, 12-week uh, basic training courses given. And uh, from there, went to uh, uh, engineer school to be a bulldozer operator and end up being a rifleman. As a rifleman, I was uh, what listed as what in, back in the old, old days we would call pipeline, meaning we had no trade other than being a rifleman and we were shipped off or I was shipped out to Korea. I got into Korea in March of 1948 and I joined the, uh, I was joined up with the 7th Division and my assignment was with the 31st Infantry Regiment, L Company, and as a rifleman. And there with, uh, at L Company, uh, most of our, other than infantry training, we did a lot of guard duty around the different consulates of, in Seoul, Korea. Uh, L, I was in L Company, the 31st Infantry Regiment, the Polar Bears, and uh, at the 31st, uh, our main mission was guard duty around the different consulates in Seoul, Korea. Uh, the Russian consulate, the uh, uh, the different consulates, and so from there, uh, we, they begin when Korea got their independence in July of 1948. Uh, we would the 7th Division begin to break up and and be shipped out to different corners. Uh, the 31st Infantry Regiment went on to Japan, Hokkaido, Japan. I, uh, being a short-timer, had to stay behind and was then uh, assigned to E Company of the 32nd Infantry Regiment, which was on the 38th Parallel. And on the third, from there, on the 38th Parallel, the E Company's mission was to occupy the different out outposts along the 38th Parallel because the North Koreans and the Chinese, excuse me, the Russians, Chinese weren't in, the, in the, at that time, uh, they liked to play games by moving the 38th parallel marker posts. Now, I was assigned on our post 14, and which was there where the Imjin River makes a big horseshoe, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, as it goes north to south and then uh, follows on to east. Uh, e Company of the 32nd Infantry Regiment was uh, based in Quezon, Korea, which was at that time the original capital city of Korea. Anyhow, uh, once the, the South Koreans took over the responsibility of patrolling and monitoring the uh, uh, 38th parallel, uh, we were pulled back off of the 38th parallel and the, the 32nd Infantry Regiment then went to Japan and again I stayed back in the, uh, with a new unit now called the 5th Regimental Combat Team and the 5th Regimental Combat Team our mission was to make sure all of the South Koreans knew how to handle all of the different outposts and, and make and different patrols uh, in April of 1949, I was then uh, shipped out to uh, back to, to Japan to the 7th Division again, uh, rejoined the 31st Infantry Regiment and was uh, back with L Company one more time. From L Company uh, uh, went uh, a new a platoon was organized called the Heavy Mortar Platoon, with 4.2 mortars, and from there, uh, they're looking for new people to uh, fill those 
uh, positions, I volunteered to get into the mortars and got into the heavy weapons. Now, I was in the 4.2 mortar platoon until uh, uh, November of 1949. In uh, 1949, then we got shipped back home, uh, or I got shipped back home, and uh, was getting ready to get discharged in, in August of uh, 1950 when the Korean War broke out. In, uh, in June of 1950. I was shipped to uh, uh, in Texas, uh, get the name of it. All right, from Texas, uh, the, the Korean War broke out, and naturally um, uh, the different training camps began to open up in Fort Chaffee, uh, Arkansas. I should say Fort Chaffee opened up in Arkansas, and I was shipped there to um, as as a cadre. And then Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, I uh, went ahead and uh, moved up to staff sergeant. And uh, from uh, when I made the staff sergeant, I uh, went ahead and re-enlisted uh, since we were frozen for one year anyhow. So re-enlisted uh, for uh, six years. And at that point, you know, I was uh, shipped out to the Korean War, okay? And so from there, we went straight on to uh, Incheon. Now, I, I got into the Korean War after the invasion. I didn't, I didn't get there. I was a cadre at Fort Chaffee until February of uh, 1951, okay? So... Uh, so Excuse 19, me. Tell us where the unit was located when you when you met up with the unit. Where uh, where you were located and what your job was when you okay, were assigned. Okay. When uh, when I had <clears throat> moved up to uh, the 17th Infantry Regiment, we were just at the Imjin River, and the regiment was back on its uh, way north uh, from Pusan, and uh, we were in Operation Tri uh, Iron Triangle. And from uh, there, at the Imjin River, in uh, about April the 8th, I got wounded and uh, went back with, uh, to Japan. Give us the details how you were wounded. Okay, I was uh, wounded uh, as an as 81 millimeter mortar FO uh, in forward position there. And then on the Imjin River, uh, we got into some heavy uh, opposing... Uh, uh, mortifier, the, uh, the the Chinese uh, mortifier, and I got uh, in a, a uh, um, hit by a mortar round, shrapnel from a mortar round, which kind of took me out of service for about two and a half months. And just then, when I returned to the 17th Infantry Regiment, we were again on the move forward, and this time this was operation called uh, Killer. Uh, this is was where uh, where uh, General MacArthur had gave the, the orders a memo order, you know, said if if the China if the, the enemy doesn't say you all shoot it, okay. So there was Operation Killer. From there we were. Excuse me. Can you tell us when that what month that was? Okay, that that was uh, Operation Killer was uh, around uh, June and July. Uh, and we were uh, about that time and we were moving forward and we uh, moved up to a position uh, the name of the on the on the, uh, the name of the object uh, oh, I'm losing my point there. that's all right okay. that's okay slow down uh, relax the see? name of the hill we were going to take was called old baldy on the map it's called hill 868 Okay, and that's 868 meters above sea level, in case anybody's interested. But anyhow, we pounded that for about two months, two and a half months with artillery fire and mortar fire, and finally we took all of the, sh the vegetation off the top of the mountain. I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop you a second. You never told us, uh, let me stop this. Just, okay. okay, when I returned to the 17th Infantry Regiment, in uh, March of uh, 1951, 
I was assigned to H Company, 2nd Battalion, and uh, since I was in heavy weapons, I was assigned as the 81 millimeter mortar forward observer. That was my job, and I was in charge of uh, section chief for the 1st and 2nd section uh, of the mortar platoon. Okay, we, each mortar platoon has two forward observers or two section chiefs, and uh, we each have a set of guns uh, at that time. Yeah, uh, the uh, mortar section consists of uh, two, uh, two 81 millimeter mortars uh, per section, or you have two sections, so that's four per uh, mortar FO. The yeah, function of the 81 millimeter mortar forward observer is to follow and be with the battalion commander and it's basically the light infantry second uh, battalion commander's personal artillery so to speak. Do you remember who the battalion commander was at that yeah, time? The battalion, you, commander, okay. the, yeah. battalion commander at that time was uh, uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel DeShazo, I remember that because of his name, and, uh, and he was with us uh, for uh, about uh, three months before he was changed out, and I don't remember who the next one was. Okay. Uh, from, uh, let's see, where are we? You were heading toward, you, were, you, were, you told me you were firing on Old Baldy, okay, and, you, and you knocked out all the vegetation on yeah, Old Baldy. Okay. Pick it up from there. All right, after we took off all the vegetation from Old Baldy, Baldy had uh, a very distinctive uh, uh, landmark or a, a, a shape on the map, okay? It looked like a three-cornered star. One, one finger or ridge line went straight north, and the other two went either southeast or southwest, okay? The southwest one was assigned to Fox Company. I re remember that because I was assigned to Fox Company. Okay, and we had the Southwest uh, Ridge Line to take, and Easy Company had the right side, and there, there they had my good buddy, uh, Sergeant LeBlanc, was the FO for that uh, company. And uh, we went on up. After we took the, the top off of that, we went uh, to now occupy Old Baldy, and the Chinese and the South Korean, North Koreans hadn't quit fighting with that. Okay, we had the Chinese and the North Koreans in front of us, and uh, they weren't about ready to give up that mountain, so it took us another two to three days uh, to finally take the top of that mountain. Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, there's where we got uh, some little friendly fire strafing from the, uh, the U.S. Navy because uh, they can sometimes read the front side of the panel marker. We, we always had a panel marker on our lead man, but anyhow, uh, the Navy did a fine job uh, with their Corsairs. They would get right on in the trenches with them Chinese and, and dig them right on out. Anyhow, uh, we finally took Old Baldy, and, uh, and once we secured that, uh, we stayed there for about uh, six, about four to six weeks, and then the second battalion was pulled back for some uh, uh, recuperation time and and a reorganization because we lost quite a few people on that action. Uh, lost probably uh, fifty percent of the battalion. Uh, Do you remember any of the people that were killed? That did you know any of them? Uh, by name, no, I don't okay. know. Okay, okay, go ahead. Any yeah. of them. By my, the only people as a, as a forward observer, you only remember the people that are around you. I remember my radio operator, and I remember uh, my South Korean uh, radio operator, and uh, I remember my people from uh, the, my mortar section, okay? And a few of the company commanders. And when I was with Fox Company on that particular assault, the, uh, the company commander's name was Captain Berger. Remember that because of hamburger, okay? And we used to kid him about that. When was, when were we going to have some hamburger? And uh, but backing up to that, uh, uh, my nickname, although my was called Sergeant Mirabella, uh, my nickname because of one small incident became Short Round, 
Tell us well, about that incident. And that incident was that when we were uh, firing, uh, each mortar round has exposed propellants that, that are attached by the gunners. And this gunner had forgot to attach the proper amount of propellants to the, to the shell. So as quick as they fired it, the gunner realized that the, they hadn't put the proper amount of propellant in there, he called me on the radio and said we were going to have a short round. And well, but you know that that short round just fell about uh, 50 yards short of the Fox Company's uh, uh, headquarters uh, as we moved up. And then, of course, I hollered short round and nobody got hurt. But from then on, I kind of was hung for the rest of the Korean War with old Sergeant Short Round. Okay, because of that. Anyhow, people might remember me as uh, the old short round. But uh, from there, we kind of went into uh, regrouping, and we re, uh, went to the rear area there for about uh, three months, no, about two months. And uh, that was in October, and then we went operation. That would be October 51? October of 1951, and we began Operation Punch Bowl. Okay, and then we moved up into the punch bowl area and relieved the, uh, the uh, South Koreans and, um, went, and then went forward of the punch bowl to another ridge line of, of mountains called the outpost line of resistance. From there we just you, Excuse me, can you tell me if you can recall in relation to say Seoul or relation to the Chowan Valley where you were at that point? What, okay, the, and, and, and mm, if you can geographically yeah. about where you were. The punch, the punch bowl area is uh, mm, a punch bowl uh, area. If I remember right on the map, was probably uh, uh, 100 kilometers uh, or more north of the 38th parallel. Okay, and basically centrally located in, in Korea. Not, the east or west, it was centrally located. So that would put it somewhere north of the Chowan Valley, north yeah. of the t a tank approach to Seoul. Right, yeah. Which That's the Han River ran through, I guess. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, but but the, the Han River, I think, was on the, on the uh, east side of us. Right, yeah. okay. Okay, and uh, so um, uh, from there, the punch bowl, I basically uh, put the, the Korean part of my, uh, my uh, experience to rest. Uh, we stayed in that area until, uh, I stayed in that area until February 1952. Uh, just about the time that the peace talks began and probably uh, fired the last 81 millimeter mortar round before the peace talks and the ceasefire took place. Now did you ever have any direct contact with the enemy yourself? Uh, Hand-to-hand -hand combat? Not hand-to-hand, -hand, but just see them out in front of you or... Oh, yeah. Go ahead, I, tell us about that. Well, as, a, as an 81 millimeter forward observer, you're right there in, with the lead platoon at all times. See, we don't have the luxury of a, of a field artillery uh, observer, which is always back in the area where the battalion or regimental commander sits or is moving through. Uh, this, uh, the... The 81 and, and the 60 millimeter, the 60 millimeter mortar uh, is the company commander's personal artillery. Okay, so between the two of us, we were always up there with the lead platoon. Okay, and hand-to-hand, uh, uh, -hand, not hand-to-hand, -hand, but uh, firefights with, uh, with the enemy were very common uh, with the FO. I lost uh, two radio operators. Uh, due to firefights and, um, uh, and lost one uh, communications uh, radio uh, man with, uh, due to artillery fire uh, from the, uh, the uh, enemy, the Chinese. And so we were always up there pretty much uh, uh, second squad behind the man with the panel. We had to see what was going on and we had to see what that company could give that company commander the kind of over, uh, overhead protection that he, he needed for, for, you know, for the guys. Did you go out at all with the INR platoon? 
the top of S2? Uh, no, but yeah, I went, I went out with, uh, that's what we did a lot of in, at the punch bowl was, uh, uh, we would take, we would form up a squad and we would take out these, uh, uh, INR specialists and take them out and, uh, make, sometimes make, uh, contact patrols where we purposely contact, made noise and, and contacted uh, the Chinese lines. And then there was sometimes that we took out uh, a couple of captains, sometime that we were told uh, to take them out, make contact, and you won't see these guys again, okay, that we would leave them where they were, okay. And uh, so there was a lot, quite a bit of that going on. Uh, the, did, did you ever experience the trumpets and the whistles that the Chinese used? Oh yeah. Oh, Tell uh, us about that. On Baldy, when we were on fighting on Baldy, we were on, on the North Finger, and we had the, half the North Finger taken, and uh, all of a sudden we got into what they call an overrun, when they all start running uh, in a great big horde and start blowing whistles and, uh, and bugles and they try to overrun your positions and we uh, uh, they, they tried that one time on the north finger of Baldy uh, but uh, we were able to hold them back with uh, uh, 81 mortar fire, artillery mortar fire and, uh, and some heavy machine gun fire so we we had them channeled on one one finger so to speak so that that's the only running space they had right and, so uh, the artillery had all of the, the valleys took care of, and uh, so uh, that was how that went down. Now I saw that you had a Chinese hat that you were wearing in that picture. How did yeah. you acquire that? Well, I got that off of Baldy. Got that off of a dead uh, lieutenant. Well, say that instead of saying I got that. Tell oh. me what about like tell us the story about, about how you got that. Well, I have a picture, and when we got back into reserve of uh, me with, uh, with uh, a Chinese um, scarf. Uh, that I took off of a dead Chinese officer. Uh, they had silk scarves, some of them, uh, that they wrapped their gohan in, in their, around their bellies with. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we got, I got that from there. My running up old Baldy got into a couple of uh, firefights and I got a lot of blood on me, helping some of the guys out. Uh, getting first aid and all that, so I was in bad need of a shirt. And this particular Chinaman happened to have a brand new uh, shirt tucked up underneath his uh, on his chest. So I got that. So I came off the hill that when I, it was time for me to get cleaned up and we secured. You know, I came off the hill to get take a shower and, and stuff like that, and I had me with me a, my little Chinese uh, scarf that I made into a turban, a Chinese. Officer's hat, uh, shirt on, uh, got his pistol from him. He had a P38 pistol, and uh, uh, so came off the hill like looking like Mr. Tough Guy. Okay. <laughs> now, um, since I joined the 17th Infantry back on the northern, second northern run, uh, I and that that early time, there was a lot of uh, uh, history that took place that I only heard of from uh, the officers and the guys who participated. And I always like to brag on the fact that the 2nd Battalion of the, of the 17th Infantry Regiment was the first seventh Infantry Regiment to reach the Yalu River. We touched the Yalu River. We, and the guys said they could look right across that it looked like a great big sandy uh, uh, creek, all right? Well, when the Chinese came into the war and started driving our troops back, the 2nd Battalion of the 17th Infantry Regiment at that time under Colonel Williams, I believe, uh, was given the task of uh, being rear guard. And while the rest of the regiment and, uh, and the battalion all headed south, headed for Hung Nam, okay, the 17th Infantry Regiment's, excuse me, the 2nd Battalion's mission was to perform a delaying action and a rear guard action. Well, 
halfway to Hung Nam, uh, the regiment, the, the, excuse me, the battalion lost contact with regimental headquarters and uh, we were off basically on our own. And by the time we got to Hung Nam, and I say we even though I wasn't there, but I feel like I was there, when, uh, when we got to Hung Nam, we were the lost battalion because uh, because of losing contact with regimental headquarters it was considered that we had been annihilated and, and, and gone, okay? Well, consequently, we had no passwords. We had no way to penetrate the Hung Nam perimeter, all right? So Colonel Williams supposedly put out the words and fellas, you know, there ain't but one way to get in to that perimeter. We're going to have to fight with our own, you know, be stealth and be fight with our own troops. And we got ourselves into the perimeter and uh, <clears throat> we got there with uh, 117 men and the second battalion <clears throat> started the rear guard action and had something like uh, uh, 1,100 men, close to 1,200, almost a full uh, battalion strength. Okay. And uh, so we lost a lot of men in that particular rear guard action. Very little people know about that, okay? And I was lucky to meet and work with the guys who were in that action, you know, to, to tell me the story. And uh, now I'm telling okay. it to you. That's great. Now tell me uh, now what the winter was like, the winter of 51, the winter in Korea. The winter of 51 was, uh, started out uh, very cold until we got the Mickey Mouse boots. And then uh, <clears throat> around uh, the middle of November, uh, we got the Mickey Mouse boots and we all got warm feet. And that made a big difference. And, and, and then the Parkers came in. And uh, so, they, although it was a cold winter, it wasn't the... Let me, I, let me, I, let me, let me stop you a second, because that clock's... Go ahead. Uh, the Mickey Mouse boot. It got its name because it was made out of rubber and the, it had a great big bull nose on it and it looked very much like the boots that Mickey Mouse, the comic, wears. The difference between that boot and the boots we were wearing, the regular GI combat boots, is the insulation. The regular GI combat boots being very durable was one thing, okay, but they were, would also get waterlogged, soggy, wet, and very cold, okay? The Mickey Mouse boot was made out of rubber, and I can't give you the official military name for it because I don't know it, but that's what it was called. It was made out of rubber, <clears throat> and you had to wear, <clears throat> you had to wear a very thin nylon sock in, in this instead of the old GI cushion sole socks. And, and you got issued one pair of boots and three pair of socks. And uh, we, we got the three pair of socks because your feet would sweat inside the Mickey Mouse boot, okay? And since they were airtight, the air, the, the sweat created the heat, okay? And that kept your feet warm. In, in the coldest and coldest of days, your feet would be warm. Do you have any idea what the temperature was during that winter? What the low? In that winter of 51, uh, the coldest temperature, uh, I would only be guessing because we never did have any real uh, weather numbers on that, but I would say that many of the days in December were uh, below 15 degrees in the middle of the day. Okay. And did you did you run into any guys who suffered from frostbite while you were there? Uh, a few. Uh, there you, a give few, me the sentence. There was a few frostbite uh, uh, guys that who uh, wouldn't change their socks on the Mickey Mouse boots. Wouldn't run the water out. You know, there's always that uh, that don't follow all that they uh, should do. But we had just a few, mostly frostbitten fingers and frostbitten noses. Uh, ears, and that was just basically from standing guard duty uh, on the uh, on the MLR. Uh, you know, you had to be awake and you had to be standing, not so much standing there, but just in your foxhole, in your bunker hole, and um, so it those you couldn't start no fires. 
talk about fires. We fought one time, we had the Ethiopians with us in uh, the 17th Infantry, uh, and uh, the Ethiopians were on our left flank, and uh, they were excellent fighters, excellent. Uh, and they love, they love con uh, personal contact, but they're from a hot country. And come uh, October of uh, 1951, they were freezing to death. They just couldn't make it, and they started lighting fires on the front line and to keep warm. They didn't, they, did the war be damned? They were going to keep warm. So naturally, the Chinese now had something to shoot at, so these fires were just like a candle. So we had to take, pull the Ethiopians off the front line and, and replace them. And, uh, they, they, but they were good troopers during the summertime. In, uh, in, uh, on the punch bowl uh, towards uh, January, the, uh, the Turks, uh, the Turkish battalion moved in on our right flank. And they, they were covering our right flank and they replaced the uh, uh, first marine division uh, battalion of the first marine division that was on our right flank and uh, with the turks and they're also good hand-to-hand -hand combat troops in those days uh, can you tell us something about your impression of the average fighting man in the 17th tell us something about the guys in the 17th the average uh, the 17th infantry regiment had a very very high esprit de corps uh, that was the word we used we were proud of the buffalo we were proud of uh, uh, our colonel buffalo bill quinn and uh, of course uh, i don't know if anybody's ever i haven't read anything along the way but nobody's ever really kind of mentioned how he got his name buffalo bill because buffalo bill thought he was general Patton. When we get ready to jump off on a, on a skirmish or, or something of that nature, he, uh, he fed the troops beefsteak, fresh milk, and ice cream, okay? And uh, when you got that meal, and that steak used to cover that whole tray, when we got that meal, we knew that six o'clock in the morning we would be crossing the IP somewhere. Well, the IP being the initial point uh, of departure. Buffalo Bill would be right there with his two pearl handle 45s. Not Colts, but uh, regular Army 45s with, their per with his pearl handles. Excuse me, Mike, you're rocking, so what's happening is you sort of might be going uh, well, in and out of focus. Me. That's all okay. Right. Go ahead, it's all right. Doing great, though. Okay, so he, uh, he was there, and everybody's seen him like a General Patton, see? And, uh, but since his name was Quinn, somewhere along the line, somebody just called him Buffalo Bill Quinn, all right? And he didn't mind. He never, ever uh, sent a memo out to all of the uh, officers and non-commissioned officers about that would not be a tolerated name for the regimental commander. And because of the, of the distinction of the buffalo, which is not in the original crest of the 17th Infantry Regiment, okay, uh, uh, somebody who lived out in Arizona, one of the, the troops' father, sent all the way to Korea a live buffalo to, uh, uh, at that time, he was Colonel Quinn, okay. And of course, we couldn't, uh, all kind of red tape and all that, and we weren't allowed to keep the buffalo, but uh, he was proud to be a part of that. Now, now he had a big mustache during the war, did, and I was told by somebody that the guys would grow mustaches to be like him, to have a mustache. Yeah, he had a handlebar mustache, you know, and those who could grow, it was allowed. You know, anybody who could grow a mustache and wanted to uh, could, could uh, you know, he was proud of his troops. And we were proud of him, and so we were a very proud regiment. We I was uh, talking to somebody uh, earlier, and we would capture these Chinese. Uh, another reason why we were such a proud res regiment, we would catch these seasoned Chinese. There was two kind of Chinese in the action. There was the seasoned ones, the, the men who were over 
20 years old and had been in the war since the beginning. And then there was always the little juniors who were sometimes barely 15 and 16 years old. Okay. The seniors, when we would capture them, Used to, call, used to call us, they said that our name, we were not regarded as the 17th Infantry Regiment in the Chinese people. We were regarded and known as the Tiger Regiment. Okay. And uh, so whenever they knew basically that they were in front of the Tiger Regiment, the Chinese always sent their most seasoned veterans. Okay, so that's what we had to fight. And we fought them all, but we fought proud. And uh, I never knew a guy that I ever met uh, that wasn't uh, proud to be a Buffalo. Uh, I left there as a sergeant first class, uh, rotated back to the United States in February 1952, uh, went back to Fort Chaffee, started training more uh, people to go uh, to Korea and elsewhere, and kept going. And, and I ended up, uh, because of that six-year uh, enlistment, I just went ahead and did 20. I said, what the heck? So on my, uh, uh, two months after my uh, 27th birthday, I retired from Uncle Sam's Army.